for a postdoc. Um, and then after stints at uh, University of Vermont and at Northeastern, where he's still affiliated, uh, he became the managing director of the Pandemic Prevention Institute of the Rockefeller Foundation. And a few years ago, also joined our external faculty. And in addition to being a good friend and an excellent cook, um, he, I, I admire his science very much because he's, uh, in addition to being one of the people who's brought network theory as a way into epidemiology to handle the many inhomogeneities and complicated structures of epidemics, um, he's also been one of the most visible scientists in the response to COVID. And before that, um, has done very important work on pertussis, pertussis and Ebola. And anyway, it's going to be a great talk. So, oh. great. Well, thank you, Chris, very much for that kind introduction. Um, of course, we know that past success is no guarantee of existing talk performance. So hopefully, the, hopefully the talk will be good. Um, and it's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues. Many of you I haven't seen uh, since even before the pandemic, uh, but really thrilled to be here and thrilled to tell you about some of the work that we've done around SARS-CoV-2 and some of the ways in which I think that our efforts that have started here at the Santa Fe Institute from people like Professor Lauren Ansel Myers and others have really built towards many of the successes we've had during SARS-CoV-2. I know it doesn't necessarily seem like there have been many successes, but I think uh, there certainly have been. One of the things I'm not going to talk about very much today, but I realized maybe I should have is, so Sid was asking me about why things are so hard to forecast. And just as I was leaving Santa Fe as a postdoc, that was a question I was trying to answer by looking at the entropy of different infectious disease time series. And the short answer seems to be infectious diseases are hard to forecast because the rules that govern them shift in time. That's a bit of a hand wave explanation for what's really going on. And so the sort of Bayesian learning thing that we like to do where we aggregate over lots and lots of time series to try to learn the model parameters is guaranteed to fail in that regard. And that's, of course, what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2 as it plays out now. If we want to know whether there's going to be a surge in New Mexico from this BA.2 variant you may have heard about, well, it depends on exactly what's happening with BA.2. We still don't know the mechanisms behind its resurgence um, or, its, or why it's surging. Even in this room, everybody's vaccinated because you have to be to be here, but I don't know what you were vaccinated with and when. I don't know if any of you have had different SARS-CoV-2 infections. And in fact, tomorrow during Professor Ogunu's uh, colloquium talk, he's gonna tell us about how the way in which we conceptualize our environment at least helps us understand why things can be so difficult to predict. Because if I really wanna say something about what's gonna happen in this room, I, I probably have to know the state of everybody in this room, which is, going to be very, very hard to actually measure. So I wanted to start with this quote, and I think that this is fully attributable to Professor Dodds at the University of Vermont, but keep me honest if it isn't. And so one of the things that, that Professor Dodds always says is that you should never bring data to a story fight. And that's, that's actually what Brandon and I were talking about just before this is, there's this interesting thing that we've learned about science and science communication during SARS-CoV-2 that it's as much about being out there talking to people as it is about being right. And one of the things that I think we have to try to understand is more around the science of how we actually communicate people and meet them where they are in terms of deciding how they're going to behave during a pandemic. And again, that to me sounds like a very Santa Fe uh, Institute type of, of research. This is, of course, uh, Kurt Vonnegut talking about the shape of stories. And I think that one of the things that we can learn are from the many ways in which people have tried to conceptualize how things go up and back down again, whether we're talking about the narrative arc of the story uh, or, or an epidemic. It's going backwards now. And I'm realizing this is not my first talk I've given since the pandemic. The first one was actually at Yale with with Brandon, but this is the first talk where I haven't been trapped behind a podium because Zoom wasn't working at Yale. And so I forgot that there's this uh, hazard here. So where does all this start in terms of the shape of, of epidemics? And we've heard a lot about this FARS law if you've been paying attention to the COVID forecasts. And interestingly with FARS law, it's one of these classic old things that everybody thinks they understand, 
And then when you try to find the citation for it, it turns out you can't. And so I was actually on Twitter this morning trying to find what FAR actually said about the shape of epidemics in the 1800s. And the citation trail goes cold pretty fast to a paper in 1975. And fortunately, a librarian, uh, no, a, a professor at the um, Purdue, who I don't know, emailed me after seeing the Twitter thread with the actual WHO bulletin in the 1800s, not WHO, uh, UK bulletin that FAR published on. But he did say, epidemics appear to be generated at intervals in unhealthy places, spread and go through a regular course and decline. But of the cause of their evolution, no more is known. Um, if the latent cause of epidemics cannot be discovered, the mode by which it operates may be investigated. The laws of its action uh, may be determined by observation. And so far I had this idea that epidemics go up and come back down symmetrically. And we know that isn't true. And in fact, Farr also knew that wasn't true. I'm gonna show you a quote in a second where Farr says he knows that isn't true, uh, but he's gonna do it anyways. But this piece here, the laws of its action may be determined by observation. We're still arguing about this in the field of epidemiology and epidemic forecasting, whether one has to actually understand the mechanisms of spread or whether you can just fit a statistical model to the data and project that forward in time. And this quote is, you know, 200 years old going on, and we still don't have a clear agreement in the field on whether we actually have to know the mechanism of BA.2 spread if I'm going to project <clears throat> resurgence, or whether I can just fit a curve to it and run that curve forward in time. Now, of course, interestingly, one of the reasons that we might be, so I think in general, short-term epidemic forecasting is a, not a solved problem, but there are lots of people who are very good at it. The challenge is figuring out how good is very good. Because if you take most infectious disease time series and calculate the first difference, it's basically mean zero with a constant there. So if I want to predict how many cases there are tomorrow, it's going to be hard to beat just guessing the same number of cases that we had today. You have to get two or three weeks out before it actually starts to diverge in a meaningful way. In a given flu season, flu kills between 10 and 100,000 people in the U.S., and SARS-CoV-2 is 10 times deadlier than flu. And so if you just multiply that by 10, you actually get right in the range of what happened during the first year of SARS-CoV-2. So again, it's actually in some cases not so hard to make some of these broad generalizations around forecasting, which means it's even harder to answer this question about whether understanding the mechanisms matter if what we care about is prediction, right? So we might care just to know the mechanisms because we wanna learn about how the world works. But if we just wanna make forecasts, it may not be the case that actually learning the mechanisms helps you forecast any better than just historical averaging. Yep. That's it. But presumably that's a that's a kind of time scale problem, right? I mean, it's short term versus medium time scales versus long time scales in terms of extrapolating some phenomenological fit to data into the future. I mean, you know, as scientists, we believe that understanding means that you know maybe at some stage this is going to break down. That, uh, or not, whatever the system is. So mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, some, it, it's, it's not just a one size fits all answer to that question. No, I, th I think that's right, Jeffrey. And the, I have a slightly more, a slightly different take on that. And again, I am wishing that I had talked about this other paper because I would love all of your opinions on it. But the argument that we make in that paper is that for the infectious diseases we studied, that the statistical forecast will break down at the same time as the mechanistic forecasts. And so you can choose your own adventure. Again, if you care about the mechanism, which some of us do, I'm in that camp quite often, then that doesn't help you. You, you have to go out and learn about the mechanism. But if you care about forecasting, one of our claims is that the, the statistical forecast and the mechanistic forecast will fall apart at about the same time in part because the, and the mechanisms aren't changing, but that's the like that's the easy way of saying the mechanisms are changing uh, behind the infectious disease process. Yeah, I mean, sort of on that same note, it seems like the, the back of the envelope flu prediction, it, it's almost surprising that that does so well because we don't do societal-wide quarantines around flu. And so it's sort of, I mean, it's from that same sort of mechanistic thing, it's, it's actually, you would have a prior would have guessed the flu thing should be really far off because we of course don't respond in the same way that we did to COVID. Well, in some ways, the not responding makes it easier, right? So the the fact that we keep shifting lockdowns, not lockdowns, mask wearing, not mask wearing, vaccine mandates, all of that probably makes it harder to predict because 
you have to understand how people are going to respond. One of the things that's very clear in the mobility data is people lock down if they have the privilege to do it as fast as they get scared. And that always happens before the mandates go in place. An example of this, in 2020, Massachusetts actually had the hardest lockdown if you measure people's displacement from their household, but we never had a mandatory shelter in place order. It was a stern warning from the governor, but it's because people were scared because we, Massachusetts is also one of the only places in the US where Omicron hasn't eclipsed all previous waves. So this Omicron wave has more deaths than the Delta wave in Massachusetts, but not back in March of 2020. So in some ways, it's that human behavioral component. This is work that Joshua Weitz has done at Georgia Tech, trying to understand how, if you have even a very simplistic model of the way, because I don't mean to say it's simplistic, it's simple enough that we can understand it. Shifting model of human behavior, it rapidly leads to breakdown in, in the forecast horizon. So just very quickly, this was a paper in 1990 uh, published, I think in New England Journal of Medicine, if not there, an equally prestigious uh, medical journal where they took data on HIV AIDS through basically 1989. And they just fit this FARS law to it, which assumes you're gonna have a symmetric, perfectly symmetric curve. And they estimated that the HIV epidemic pandemic would end in somewhere between 1994 and 1995. And this of course is not what happened. It's not even close to what happened. And this again is part of the reason why so many of us were so deeply critical of the forecasts coming out of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Back in 2020, they literally just did FARS law to estimate how many people were going to die and when it was going to end. And they were also very arrogant about it. And so I feel like personal taste here, you either can be right and arrogant or wrong and humble, I think right and humble is probably the best, but you don't really want that combination of being aggressively wrong and arrogant because that also holds back the science and the public health. But there is something very interesting, and I'll come back to it if I have time. Journalists still use these forecasts every single day. Now, thankfully, they've moved on a little bit from FARS law. They still use a very, very simplistic model. In fact, the error, the cone of uncertainty shrinks as their forecast goes out forward in time. I can tell you why that is a a very easy thing to trap yourself into if you're fitting these kinds of models. But journalists use these every single day. And I think it's a pretty simple reason. And it goes back to Peter Dodds's quote about bringing stories instead of data. They made these readily available at the county level, open source in real time. So journalists can take the open source projections, they can reformat them to match their style guides, and they can run them as infographics on their web page. And it all happens at the county level. Even the county level is too coarse for infectious disease. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. But I really think that's something that we can learn about the kinds of science we need to be doing around epidemic forecasting is it has to be hyper-local because that's the only thing people care about. I don't care anymore about what's going on in Washington, D.C., where I live now. I care about what's happening in Santa Fe. And I actually don't even really care that much about what's happening in Santa Fe. I want to know, I've been eating outdoors at Tune Up because they actually have outdoor dining right now uh, with heaters, it's pretty nice. But there's pretty limited outdoor dining around Santa Fe. Is it safe? I don't know, it depends on the neighborhood. It depends on the prior rates. It depends on all the things I told you that I don't know about this room to make that decision. Of course, it also depends on my own risk tolerance and a bunch of other things related to human behavior. But these IHME forecasts, it told, it told us to be popular and to capture attention, you don't need to be right. You just need to be relevant. It'd be nice if we could be right and relevant, which is what we're trying to work towards. And you also need to communicate in a format that is amenable to what people need to do with the results. Now, again, I'm not saying that all science should conform itself to relevant and, and you know, of use to journalists. But if our goal as epidemiologists working on pandemics is to try and prevent them from happening, we have to influence people's behavior. We have to influence politicians. We have to be out in the mainstream press. And we can learn quite a bit around sort of the science of how one might actually do that. And in and of itself raises really interesting scientific questions. How do I generate? I've already told you it's hard to do forecasting. Why on earth would I try to make that problem harder by forecasting at an even finer spatial scale? So just, just to show you, I'm not making this up. 
So uh, I don't know this individual, Eric uh, Locke, and I did not do this work. I just took it off of his Twitter page. So this is the reported COVID-19 deaths on a log scale from 2020 through about the present. And the black line here, this is what actually happened. And the blue lines are the forecasts for IHME that underpredicted the deaths. And the red lines are the over prediction. So you can see FARS law here, right? This was their original forecast that deaths were going to be over basically by late spring 2020, and then COVID would be a thing of the past. But they continue, they, they have said they moved off the FARS law, but they still have a lot of these models that we know are wrong. And FAR actually anticipated this. So if you read a little bit further down in the paper, the decline of the epidemic, he's talking about smallpox, was less rapid than its rise. So he already says it's not symmetric. And the mortality was somewhat greater in the autumns of 1838, 1839 than in the summer. So there's some kind of seasonal effect. Uh, but by taking the mean of the deaths in the third and fourth period, the mean of the deaths in the fourth and fifth period, et cetera, a regular series of numbers is produced. So not surprisingly, if you do a bunch of averaging, you get something that looks pretty symmetric and ignores the spatial variation and the seasonal variation. But all the way back to far, he's telling us that the curves aren't symmetric, that there are many other factors that one has to consider. So this has led me to this kind of frustration, which is we keep using models we know are wrong. SARS, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, SARS-CoV-2. I have a, another slide here, which I stopped using because people said it was too antagonistic, but the science paper that basically fit a mass action model to crowded apartment buildings in Southeast Asia and extrapolated it to Toronto has an order of magnitude more citations than the paper from Lauren Ansel Myers and Mark Newman showing how to actually do this correctly and get a reasonable estimate of the SARS-CoV-2 risk. And so again, it's this science communication piece. It's why we still have FARS law being done by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and the White House using it. It's why we still have mass action models that are ubiquitous. It's because the first science paper that comes out about SARS fits the mass action model. And so the next time it come, comes around, it seems like a totally reasonable thing to do. Same with H1N1, Ebola, Zika, SARS-CoV-2. I have a version of this talk that I give where there were two very prominent medical journals that published essays saying the risk of sustained sexual transmission of Zika is low. And so for those of you that aren't aware, Zika, even though it's a mosquito-borne virus, can be transmitted from person to person uh, via sexual intercourse. And I called up Lorraine Baird Dufresne, who's known to many of these professor at the University of Vermont. I said, Laurent, what do we know about a vectored pathogen that is also sexually transmitted in terms of just the physics. Like, just tell me that you have a model sitting on your shelf that answers the question, how likely is this to be stable in the simplest case? And Laurent says, nobody knows anything because nobody ever knew that that could happen. Nobody ever thought that there'd be a mosquito-borne disease that would be sexually transmitted. And I said, well, why are there very prominent medical journals saying that it's not possible? And so we looked and they'd taken a model with mass action mixing and applied it to sexually transmitted infections and came to the conclusion that it's very unlikely under that scenario that it could be maintained endemically. And it turns out as soon as you relax that and put in realistic sexual contact networks, it's very likely to be maintained endemically. What's your, How, what's your double asterisk? Yeah, so, no, you can't see. So I don't, I'm not saying who these, I guess I have said who some of these people are, but, um, <laughs> and the second we is probably not the same subset as the first we. Although here's the interesting evolution of my thought process on this. So with Antoine Allard, Jean-Gabriel Young and Laurent Verdi Frame, we've been working on this kind of problem. And I'm now even more confused about how we should be thinking about these wrong models. And I'll tell you why. So, we did this work while Laurent and I were postdocs here at the Santa Fe Institute and, and Antoine was visiting uh, also as a postdoc. And we took this influenza time series in the US. And what I've highlighted in red here are all the places where the rate of spread is faster than you would predict given the early dynamics. So we just look at this early part of the curve. We say, how fast is this spreading? 
And then we ask, is it spreading about the same rate or is it spreading faster as you get closer to the peak? And every single season in the United States, including all of the 2009 pandemic waves, the rate of spread as you hit the peak is faster than the early spread. And it turns out that nobody had pointed this out before. So forecasting these time series is a multi-million dollar industry in the United States. And nobody had ever noticed that if you fit to the early part of the curve, the growth rate's always faster. And nobody had pointed out that there isn't a single model that allows this to happen that has been published. The most common model is a seasonal forcing model for flu, where you go from subcritical to critical by increasing the reproductive number at a particular time point. So that doesn't give you this. So it's already super critical here. It just speeds up as it comes to the peak. So it's not that much. Which is the opposite of what Farzad would do. Yes, it's the opposite of what everything would do. <laughs> now, so we looked at. Let's see here. Pointer again. He's in trouble. We looked at a very specific model that we thought would generate these data, which is as an instructor, if I get sick, I'm probably going to be replaced by somebody who can teach for me. But interestingly, I actually have quite a bit of information about the conditional probability that somebody in my social network is sick because I'm sick. I had to have gotten it from somebody. Even if it's aerosol, it's still a physical process. And so if I take Chris, who's not sick, I actually have some conditional probability about Chris's area, which is he's probably in a safer part of the network than I am. And so I'm going to take somebody from a relatively safe part of the network and rewire them into an area where I'm probabilistically less safe. And in practice, what this does is it takes lots of edges that would say be like a susceptible, susceptible edge, so like Chris and Brandon connect to each other, and rewire them to create more susceptible infectious edges, which is what governs how these epidemic models work in the simplest network case. But it takes a little bit of time to build up enough individuals such that you really see this rewiring effect. And it leads to this kind of phenomenological effect where all of a sudden it just takes off. It's spreading really fast and then you build up enough individuals, enough of these like susceptible infectious edges being rewired that you get a shift in the dynamics. And that's what we're showing here in this figure. So this is the infection rate divided by the recovery rate and the proportion infectious in equilibrium. So this is the susceptible infectious susceptible model. And we use this to illustrate the point because it's easier to solve. So this is the rate at which individuals go from infectious back to susceptible. And this is the rate at which they go from susceptible to infectious governed also by the contact process. And depending on the particular parameter combination, because this is an infinite population, there will be a fixed percentage of people that are infectious at equilibrium. So this is the proportion infectious at equilibrium. For three different rates of replacement. So, gamma is how fast I rewire those infectious teachers. So, at the lowest rate here, you can keep the proportion of infectious at zero. So, in the subcritical phase, until you get a sufficiently infectious virus relative to the recovery rate. And then you get this smooth transition into uh, endemic equilibrium that basically is a governed by you know, the rate of infection. And you increase the rate of spread and you can push the system a little bit further so you can have an even more infectious virus and still control it. But once you get to a really high rate of replacement, you end up with the situation where you can push the system really far, really, really infectious pathogens. But as soon as you get this transition, it's discontinuous. And we were able to prove this analytically, but it's discontinuous because of the presence of this hysteresis loop. And so if you wanna then drive the system back into the, the zero endemic state, you have to do a whole lot more work than you did when you went in this direction. However, this isn't the only model that looks like this. It turns out this is the only model that can explain these data. So now this is a paper by Lorraine Verdi Frame and Ben Althaus. They wrote this while they were postdocs here. Here you have, Again, basically, this is the fraction of um, 
susceptible edges in the population in the network model versus the force of infection for two different pathogens that are spreading on the same network. And they're either interacting with each other or not interacting with each other. And they're either doing this on a clustered network or an unclustered network. And it turns out that this interacting pathogens, you end up with the same kind of effect as this replacement of individuals. So you build up enough infection of pathogen A that all of a sudden pathogen B can sweep through the population. And if you're just looking, so this time series for flu, I'm gonna get this pointer right before the end of the talk. This time series for flu, this is actually not influenza. These are case reports of symptom of people who meet the symptom definition for influenza. We've looked using multi-panel PCR tests and any one of these given curves is typically only 20% flu, it's 80% other respiratory pathogens. And the 80% other respiratory pathogens is different from season to season. So this could be interacting pathogens and we just wouldn't know it because we just get one time series to look at. So we wanted to think about this particular problem. And it turns out that there's a third model that gives this same effect. And this is a model from the social sciences. Basically, it's the voter model. So the way that Brandon's going to decide whether to tweet about this talk or not, it certainly depends a little bit on Brandon's current state. But what he's going to do is he's going to look around at his neighbors and see who's tweeting. And the way he's going to decide is he's not going to tweet if it's just Chris. He's not going to tweet if it's Chris and one other person or Chris and two other people. But as soon as five or more other people are tweeting, then Brandon will tweet with probability of one. So you have this kind of like step function that governs the probability of tweeting where tweeting is now considered being infectious. And this same model gives us this burstiness, for lack of a better word, that you get in the teacher replacement model and also in the interacting pathogen model. So Laurent Jean Gav and I looked at this and here is the basically proportion infectious at equilibrium. Uh, this is again, beta divided by some recovery rate. And here we're looking, what you end up with is that the beta becomes a function of the proportion infectious. So beta actually change, the effective beta changes in time as the proportion infectious increases. What I'm showing you here is a model of interacting contagion and a model of complex contagion. And they are exactly the same. So it turns out that all models of interacting pathogens can be mapped onto a complex contagion model, where in this case, the complex contagion model is a high degree polynomial that governs that step function, which can be smooth now. And what's interesting there is the interacting pathogen model, if I want to fit it to data, I've got to have two time series, just given the number of parameters and the identifiability of them in the model. But for this complex contagion model, I actually only need one time series to fit my polynomial. And as soon as I have my polynomial, I can then forecast out into the future and actually get really accurate forecasts, even for a model that I absolutely know is wrong. And in this case, it's because essentially the physics of these complex contagions are identical to these interacting pathogens. Now, it turns out that's not true for arbitrary networks. You can, in this case, we're showing this for the mass action model, but you can, of course, come up with a pathological network where this won't be the case. But for many of our favorite stylized networks. Can you remind yeah. me what beta of, on the second, on the plot on the right, it was beta of. Yeah, but I'll explain it here because I think this is easier to see. <laughs> so it turns out the effect of this is that, so beta normally is a fixed parameter in the model. And that it's typically a combination of the per contact probability of infection and the mixing rate. So in a mass action case, it's the mixing rate row times the per contact probability of transmission. Here, what we're saying is the effective beta is a function of the proportion infectious in the population. So now if I wanna know at any given time in the model, or maybe time is just proportion infectious, if I wanna know how fast this thing is spreading, you tell me what the proportion of infectious are, I plug this into my high degree polynomial and I get a number out the other side. And so what we look for here, this blue is a model that it doesn't have this complex contagion process. Although interestingly, you always tend to get a little bit of a speed up 
as you get to really high proportion infectious. This model has the complex contagion process. And so you can see how beta increases rapidly as you have more and more, a higher and higher percentage infectious. And we looked at this in the context of a few different infectious diseases. So dengue, you see a little bit of that trend. Zika, we had to do some creative prior distributions to get this model to converge. And so this is basically just the prior. So this think about this as being flat. Um, so Zika, there's no evidence for this kind of process. And then influenza, there's a huge amount of evidence. It goes over basically two orders of magnitude, depending on the proportion <clears throat> infectious. So what we can conclude from this is one of two different things. And Jean Gabin and Laurent are in one camp, but I'm in the other camp. So they're in the camp of, this is awesome. We can fit this model to a single time series and we can forecast. And I'm in the other camp, which is, I provably can't tell you what the mechanisms are without a bunch of additional data and or assumptions. What are the little vertical ticks? These are just where we actually observe data uh, in terms of our model fit. So we have a bunch of models that we're fitting across different values of. Okay, and then what is the eye of tau in sets? Uh, this is the actual proportion infectious. So these are the epi epidemic curves. This tau is time? Yeah. Some time. Okay. Uh, we ran out of parameters. So. Um, Interestingly, and this is to the question that Sid was asking me earlier, you might say, well, couldn't I just learn the parameters of this high degree polynomial for flu? And then when I see the next flu season, couldn't I just plug in the proportion of infectious and make my forecast? And the answer is no. So if we go back to this time series, if we do the exercise of fitting this high degree polynomial to each flu season, you have different parameterized polynomials for all the flu seasons. So basically every single flu season, there's some evidence for either a complex contagion process or interacting pathogens or something else that we don't know about or this teacher replacement model, but it's different every single year. So I can't just say, learn that function over here and plug it into forecast in the future. So this is just an example. There's some interesting things. So I've yet to find an infectious disease paper where people are claiming it's a complex contagion. If anybody's aware of one, I'd love to hear about it, where you actually have this threshold effect. So complex contagion means the sort of granovetter like threshold infection. That's what, that's what that phrase means. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, because you can also imagine contagions where there's a lot of internal state and memory and some non-Markovian thing going on because there are hidden, hidden states. I, I think the argument would be that we would be able to model those with this process for a single time series, but that Laurent and Jenga may be listening and putting their heads in their hands as I'm saying that. But I think that that is a claim, again, not for, probably in the Markovian case, not for any arbitrary amount of memory. And in fact, the Giovanni Petri and I, who is principal researcher at the ISI Foundation, he and I wrote this paper on, on entropy and disease forecasting. And our favorite explanation for what's really going on is it's maybe not so much that the models are shifting. It's that if you sort of think about it, like life for back, lack of a better word has infinite memory or at least back all the way to the beginning. And you have to account for that state properly if you're going to do the forecasting. And I think that's kind of where we are with COVID right now, which is my claim at the beginning. So if I wanted to make a good forecast, even if Sid gave me the model, I would have to gather a lot of very detailed data on this room before I would be able to actually use that model to make a forecast. So here's a couple of other, here's something else that we don't see. So you can also get this. Sam. Yes. Hey, um so right there's also these weird um, density dependent models where you assume that you need some threshold of viral uh, load in order to, to be infected. Yes, 
and they they would also uh, give you uh, like an increase in uh, rate and uh, uh, hysteresis and things like that. That's right. And I, I actually think for me, um, and maybe I'll just I'm gonna skip ahead. This is, I'm gonna run out of time to tell you about some of the more interesting things. So I have to tell you about it over tea. Um, our suspicion is that you know there's approximately n people that work on infectious diseases, and there's probably n minus one or n squared models that have been proposed somewhere in that range, and probably some very small subset of them are actually different from each other in terms of what you might expect to see in the data that we have. And that's that was my other that's my throwaway answer to Sid's question about why things are so hard to predict. It's that we have this very haphazard course observational lens that all of our data come into when we make these kinds of projections, right? And so why would I ever forecast influenza data at the national level? Why would I ever forecast anything at the national level? If you think back to the Omicron wave, that was 90% New York City up until relatively recently. If you go back to the first wave in the US, again, it was 90% New York City and Boston in March of 2020. So why on earth would I just add a bunch of additional noise by trying to forecast the 50 cases in Houston and the 300 cases in Los Angeles, et cetera. So there's this granularity question and the data question. There's a whole bunch of models that seem to produce basically the same physics and pulling apart what is actually making this a hard problem to solve, I think is a very open question. All right, so is it really the case as per my earlier claim that the sort of regularized state space is shifting in time such that you can't learn a model and then use it to forecast? Or is it just our observational model is changing, but the underlying model structure is perfectly stable and we can learn parameters and forecast brilliantly into the future? Is it something else? Um, an interesting thing is you can get this negative reinforcement, but I don't think I've seen this for infectious diseases. You see this a lot on Twitter. So these are social media uh, mentions about Walter Cronkite dying. And so here's proportion of infectious beta I. And so you remember it's going up for all these infectious disease models. You get this kind of negative uh, reinforcement where people become increasingly less likely to tweet as they see their neighbors tweeting less and less. Sorry, I know you want to move on, but uh, uh, all of these curves from the, uh, the increasing side of the peak? Yes. Okay, all right. So, so none of these are describing what happens on the other side. And I, I, I mean, the, the flu peaks are fascinating because the, the derivative looks discontinuous there because you could, so you would have another inference problem with different uh, results if you use the backside of the peak. Yes, so great point, Chris. And um, that is actually now where we think most of the information about mechanism comes in mm -hmm. is on the right-hand side of the peak. So if we go back to this teacher replacement model I was telling you about, now imagine that we're in the susceptible infectious recovered state. So there's some individuals that are immune or we vaccinated them. And the only rule is I have to replace you with someone who's not sick. So I don't, I don't ascertain your status aside from whether you're sick or not, which means I can also replace you with recovered individuals. So what you end up having is you get this super rapid rise in infections as you approach the peak, but then you've built up a lot of recovered individuals and you start to rewire these edges to IR edges, which slam the brakes on the epidemic and you get this very, very rapid decline. Whereas in the complex contagion case, you actually have a much slower relaxation on the right-hand side of the curve. So our current hypothesis is that if you care about the mechanism and you only have one time series, and again, for those of you that don't work on epidemics, and I was, again, not to, Sid and I only talked for five minutes, it's amazing that I have so many things to say about it, but I was telling Sid, one of the most wonderful things about the past two years is that all of a sudden, everybody cares about these really hard problems that we've been working on for 10 years. And so the question then becomes, you know, why do you only have one time series? Who would ever, why do, why do you keep making the problem harder? And that's because, you know, we're constrained by data, et cetera, et cetera. But, we think if you only have one time series, you have to wait until it starts to come down before you're really gonna be able to distinguish from some pretty different models, right? So in terms of how you might intervene in the epidemic, if it's an interacting pathogen, you would do something very different, I assume, than if it was a voter model 
than if it was replacing teachers uh, or if it was something else. And in fact, this is one of the things that, that Professor Obuna is gonna tell us about tomorrow. There does seem to be this dichotomy going all the way back to genetics at the turn of the last century between what you can do if you make some assumptions about the kind of phenomenological process and your ability to predict versus if you want to go in and intervene at the very local level where you probably have to know the mechanism. And there's this kind of, the two are not incompatible, they're totally compatible with each other unless you want to intervene. And then it turns out if you don't understand who do I need to go and vaccinate because I then have to know the mechanism. And I actually think I know a lot of people that are working on this in this room. It's a very interesting question in terms of what the point of the forecast is gonna be and what we need to know about the mechanism. So this is some work that came out of Brandon's lab. And this paper was led by amazing PhD student, uh, Lourdes Gomez. And this largely came out of models of say hepatitis where you think there's an infected needle that's being passed around or models of cholera where there's an infected water source. And the, they call this the sit and wait model. Wait stands for something. And the idea is that there's essentially an environmental reservoir. So you, you do have a contact process where people are transmitting to each other, but you also have some other environmental reservoir where people are going to that reservoir and picking it up themselves. And so the way they model this is you have susceptible individuals exposed to so some lag. You have some asymptomatic individuals. This turns out to be really important for our observational models that a lot of people are asymptomatic and they're infectious and we can never see them. This is work that Ben and I did on whooping cough at the Santa Fe Institute that led to a book uh, and a bunch of additional work around how you study asymptomatic infections. Then people are infectious and they recover, but there's also this pernicious environmental reservoir that's infecting people uh, directly and then there are people that are depositing, including the asymptomatic individuals. And we wrote this paper, Variation in Microparasite Pre-Living Survival and Indirect Transmission to Modulate the Intensity of Emerging Outbreaks. We wrote this paper because back in February of 2020, there was a study looking at survival of SARS-CoV-2 virus on surfaces. And SARS-1 and SARS-2 have about the same survival on everything, which is not very long except for cardboard, where SARS-CoV-2 survives twice as long as SARS-1. And Brandon and I are sitting there thinking, well, what have we done since SARS-1 back in 2003? We have covered the entire world in cardboard. And maybe this explains something about what's going on. Now, he, he and I both think we're probably wrong on that now. But part of the reason it took so long to convince ourselves we were wrong is this model with the reservoir component fits data from 15 or 20 countries far better than this model without the component. And this is the dominant modeling paradigm for SARS-CoV-2 is this SEIR process. And so what we were actually then starting to think about is what is this model really telling us? This isn't anything specific about an environmental reservoir. This is instead capturing something about our uncertainty in how we learn about the process or the model itself or understand the dynamics of what's happening with the pathogen. Another way to think about this is this is also evidence for aerosol transmission. So I mentioned it's still a physical process even if it's aerosol. Well, aerosol is gonna break down that effect of direct social networks, not as much as surface transmission, but it will break this down. And so one of the things then that we're trying to understand is what are the consequences of this model uncertainty in the public health context? And so, as Chris mentioned, I left Northeastern to join the Rockefeller Foundation. They made a $100 million investment in pandemic prevention. And the goal is to sit right at this interface between our basic science understanding about how pandemics work, about human behavior, but how you actually operationalize it. And so then this is really gonna force us to answer this question. Does it matter how accurate my time series forecasts are if we can't actually intervene on them? And then if we do need to understand mechanism in order to intervene, how do we go about learning that mechanism? And am I right that there is this sort of nihilistic view that we might take to this, which is as soon as we have enough data to learn the model, that's old news. Now, the one thing I would add that's sort of a 
I'm going to say one thing before I go to the end here. Herd immunity threshold is a fantasy. It doesn't exist out of the side of the thermodynamic limit. I don't think it has any good definition in a finite size population for what people want it to mean. Endemicity basically relies on the herd immunity threshold. So endemicity is where you would have R equal one. And that's also basically the herd immunity threshold. So endemicity is just as much of a fantasy as herd immunity threshold. But it turns out there's still quite a bit about the map, even in these infinite population models that we don't understand yet. And it thinks about the behavior and the social networks that we don't understand. So we've been working on super spreading events for a while, trying to actually quantify what we mean by a super spreading event. How do you actually parameterize super spreading events? How do you make it rigorous in terms of is this number of cases really surprisingly large relative to the first and second moment of the distribution of secondary cases, that kind of thing. And then how does that feed into the herd immunity thresholds in these stylized models? And we were talking with Chris and Chris said, well, wait, 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 wait. That actually makes another assumption, which is that your in degree and your out degree are the same. So setting aside the fact that the herd immunity threshold doesn't have a meaning and endemicity doesn't have a meaning, even in the infinite population models in a social network, you still have to assume something that we don't know is true in order to say, have a quick movement to herd immunity if you vaccinate the high degree individuals. That assumes that their in degree and out degree are tightly coupled. So that's this model, high risk of spread, high risk of infection. Well, why couldn't there be people that are at low risk of getting infected, but at very high risk of spreading? Maybe let's think about a physician wearing lots of PPE, very low risk of getting infected, but if for some reason they did get infected, they might expose 50 or 100 or 200 people. What about high risk of infection, but low risk of spread? These people probably exist too. So we worked on this and it turns out that the dynamics are almost entirely driven by the end degree. So if the end degree is Poisson, the system behaves like it's entirely Poisson, even if the out degree is scale free. So not only do we make this assumption, we're over here, we were able to show that if it turns out the assumption is violated, you have different in and out degrees. In some cases, it might be totally fine to use mass action random mixing on a social network because it basically behaves like it's Poisson anyways. And in other cases, that's gonna be wildly misleading. So the one sort of positive thing that I'll mention is here. So Duncan Watts, Peter Dodds and colleagues published this paper, I think in 2004 in PNAS, where they looked at what happens when you have an epidemic model spreading in a hierarchical metapopulation. So imagine like we're in households, those households are in neighborhoods, those neighborhoods are in cities, those cities are in cities, et cetera, et cetera. And what they were able to show is that in a single, populations, like a one dean model, to use the metapopulation for English from ecology, you get one wave. Almost looks a little far and although this is coming down a little slower. If you have two layers, and there's some stochasticity here, you basically get two waves as it gets into one part of the network and then gets into the second part of the network. And as you have increasing number of layers, you get this increasing smear in the cases. And this is my favorite paper by professors Satinspiel and Herring. They took data from the Hudson, Burr, Hudson Bay Fur Trading Company during the 1918 flu pandemic, the fur traders signing in and out of the log books to parameterize a hierarchical metapopulation of 1918 flu and show that this process was happening. This paper, I think, came out before the, the Watts et al. paper. So you get these multiple waves they predict in the different fur trading camps given their connectivity structure. And so what we did is we said, well, maybe one of the reasons that COVID seems to never go away in Sao Paulo and New York City and others, but it goes like a flash in the pan in places like Manaus and, and other areas, is that this the degree of hierarchy within the city is going to affect how long the epidemic will be able to persist essentially through these metapopulation dynamics. 
And we showed using data from China and Italy, which were two places that had completed their epidemic, their first epidemic, that this holds over multiple orders of magnitude in terms of city size and epidemic duration. That it's the hierarchy in terms of how these places are organized that governs how long something is gonna stay present in the population. And this also, to go back to the Rockefeller side, leads to a bunch of really important predictions about how you might prepare for something like this. So it turns out that we did some simulation models. And it's true if you're in the basically the one beam model and you have everybody locked down that this flattens the curve. However, if you're in the multi hierarchy network, having everybody locked down actually intensifies the curve because you have so much more transmission in the household and people spend a higher proportion of their time locked down in the household. And so if you're worried about hospitals getting overwhelmed, in some regimes, lockdowns help, and in other regimes, they might actually make things worse. In addition, the sort of instantaneous demand on the hospitalizations is gonna be highest in rural areas where you tend to have much closer knit communities with much less hierarchical structure. However, and I know many of you in the room work on this and you're kind of rolling your eyes a little bit because that's a very coarse characterization of urban versus rural gradients. The other thing that this does is highlight the importance of really understanding how these cities and areas are organized and being able to monitor and measure them. Because if we're gonna go in and make specific recommendations about how to control a pandemic, I need to know something about the contact distribution, the degree of hierarchy, how that's shifting in time as we open and close schools, et cetera. And it's not like it matters a little bit. It's the difference between either flattening the curve or filling up the hospitals. So figuring out both our observation model and additional things around the basic science of these infectious diseases are critical for how you actually would operationalize this in the context of preventing pandemics. So this is why I'm ending here with, why am I so critical of it to me? Because this is a group that since day one of the epidemic has prioritized publicity over scientific accuracy. Now one, I, I don't know how we define scientific accuracy in the context of what I've just talked about, but I think we can try to figure out how we actually do both if that's what we care about. And again, that's a very SFI problem. So how do we make something go viral? in terms of our communication and how do we link that back to accuracy and how do we even define what we mean by accuracy. And I'll just mention the last one. So I have a bunch of things here that I think we could probably work on as a community. So may I get this up? Uh, here we go. So training for the next generation of health data researchers and policymakers. So I know that SFI has a long history of say bringing in science journalists and embedding them in the SFI, both so that the researchers build relationships with the science journalists, but also so that the science journalists get an opportunity to interface with the researchers. I can add, I mean, obviously we have the world's best postdoctoral program when it comes to training the next generation of thinkers like this, but you could imagine bringing in individuals like policymakers for periods of time, either as workshops or embedding them at the Institute, where you really start to train the next generation of decision makers, how to process these sorts of complex adaptive systems models, all these different layers that you have to integrate that lead to major structural differences in how you might uh, intervene. So again, I want Chris, thanks for the introduction. Thank you all very much for attending. Please be sure to come by for Brandon's talk tomorrow. It's gonna be fantastic. And I know we're at time, but I, I can stick it around and answer questions. You're not over. Thank you very much. But the only reason I was on time for the talk is because I forgot that clock was fast. And the only reason I was on time for finishing is I forgot the clock was fast. So that <laughs> clock is working. Yeah, so. yeah, I was just curious, do you have any idea, like suppose that this pandemic started like 200 years ago before there's any medical intervention, you know, would this have taken over the world if we had no medical intervention? I don't think so. So the early data from Wuhan suggested that there was probably probably 90% of introductions were going to go locally extinct just because of stochastic effects. So the thing with super spreading, right, is the biggest effect on super spreading is on the establishment probability. So if, if an infectious disease's first moment, as we showed in the paper with Laurent and Antoine and Ben, if the infectious disease's first moment is high because it's propped up by 
super spreading, that means that you have a second moment that makes it likely to stochastically go extinct before it becomes established. And so what we show in this paper is that the establishment probability is often very, very low for these diseases that rely on super spreading. Once they become established, they can often march along deterministically, largely governed by the first moment of the number of secondary infections. But back in Wuhan, it looked like we see this up and down the west coast of the US. There were many, many introductions that never took off. So I actually probably think without the high degree of connectivity now, even without medical intervention, that if, I think you know, nothing's impossible, but I would say it's pretty unlikely that a SARS-CoV-2 would, would take off. The other side of that is, I think the evidence is probably stronger for a natural origin. I don't think we've ruled out the lab leak, but here's why I think it is actually really important to answer that question, setting aside the desire to know. If it wasn't a lab leak, we could probably fit an earthquake type model and estimate that there must have been 10,000, 100,000, a million spillovers that never went anywhere before we got the one bonanza. And so what does that mean for the surveillance models that we're trying to build? We're gonna get a million false positives for every hit to respond. So one, I think probably not. Two, I think it raises a lot of questions around how we need to think about the risk of spillover in the context of what happened in, in Wuhan if it wasn't a lab leak. If it was a lab leak, then we have a very simple answer, which is an answer actually Mark Lipsitz told us at the Santa Fe Institute 10 years ago, which we have to stop doing these gain of function experiments and we need better laboratory protocols. But we need to do that regardless of whether it was a lab leak. Sam has a question. Yeah, Sam. Uh, hi, Sam. Thanks for, for a great talk. Uh, I, I was uh, heartened to hear you talk about narrative <clears throat> at the beginning and also uh, communication and I think you must have learned more than most people about communicating your science over the past couple of years, probably with some ups and downs. And uh, it's something we all need to do better. Do you, do you have a, I mean, what, what's your advice? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sam. And actually, we, we should talk because one of the, the instructions we got from the Santa Fe, not Santa Fe, Institute, from our board of uh, trustees at Rockefeller is, working to link these kinds of things to economic policy, because I'm actually not at all convinced that good public health isn't also good for the economy. Um, and I, that's a, that is definitely a, a well ingrained misnomer in my opinion, but of course the nuances and the details will matter. So the short answer is it's the Omidyar Fellowship at the Santa Fe Institute. So, you know, we had people come in and work with us in groups and in one-on-one -on, -one on communicating our assignments. We had journalists embedded here. Many of the first calls I got were from people who had done the journalism fellowship at SFI, and they had my phone number and email address as a result. And so they reached out and called. But I also learned a lot of things from like from John German and others who would sit down and coach me. Okay, if you're not live, you're always allowed to re-record. Here's what these things, you know, the basic sort of vocabulary around interacting with journalists. So that's the first thing is that I think, at least for me, I can point all roads back to the professional development work at, at SFI. The second is my relationship with the journalists shifted. So in the past, if I ever got a press inquiry, Chris would reach out as a journalist from such and such. He'd have a very specific question he'd want to ask about a paper, and then Chris would be gone from my life forever. Whereas in the new model, Chris is calling every week because Chris has to file stories every week. And so we build up a relationship and there's a lot more trust. I can be open with Chris because Chris and I have an understanding. I know where he's, where he's going, those sorts of things. And again, some of that does come back to the types of things we're doing at Santa Fe. The other part of course is like now coming over to the Rockefeller Foundation, Northeastern was great. I had really incredible support from their comms team, but they were totally overwhelmed because there's a shopping list of researchers that were you know, being asked to do media. At the Rockefeller Foundation, we have an incredible team that works with us, you know, coaching us on live interviews and, and sitting in on calls and working on our answers for journalists. And so the third answer is just practice and coaching from experts, which I guess is also the first answer. Thanks a yeah. lot. Chris. So I, I, I totally agree with your uh, diagnosis of how the IHME thing 
became so convincing that, and I guess I, I don't know if they have people there on staff that create these beautiful interactive applets and so on. I mean, my, my, my most cited paper, which is because one of my young co-authors had the wherewithal to put it on GitHub and make it easily usable and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, in addition to their, uh, let's go ahead and say violation of intellectual standards, um, there, was, there was also this really ludicrous example of completely motivated modeling, namely the so-called cubic model, which, you know, it was like, this was something where instead of fitting uh, a quadratic to the logarithm, you fit a cubic, which means that depending on the sign of the third coefficient, either uh, the entire universe will be infected or absolutely no one will be in finite time. And I guess that came out of the White House and there was actually a Nobel Prize winning economist involved. But I mean, that was like sort of the most shameful example of, in that case, the deliberate misuse while cloaking it in the appearance of sophistication and so on. How, how do you, is there any hope of like punching through that kind of thing? Because it, you know, more people have these tools now than used to, which means that there can be some real charlatanry, which from the point of view of a layperson looks just as much like science as science does. I don't know, to be honest, because I mean, I think one take home from some of the models we've been doing is that there's always a model that will tell the story you want to tell. Mm -hmm. And if you think a cubic is bad, wait till you see the polynomial that we fit for some of these models, <laughs> right? Um, yes, but you're not trying to produce a result <laughs> for the policymaker you work for. <laughs> No, oh, but it's, but I think it's, Brandon and I were actually talking about this before. It's, it's raised a lot of questions that I think a number of us have been wrestling with. I mean, what is the purpose of peer review when the science is basically being adjudicated in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal in terms of what the public and the White House care about? And if that's the case, why wouldn't you just go public with your work as fast as you possibly can. And we saw that, right? So the preprints were even too slow for researchers. People just started posting the white papers on their website so that you didn't have the 24 hour delay coming out of the preprints. I think some of it, you know, it has to be on this training side for policymakers. You have to believe that people want to do the right thing. Otherwise, it's just totally hopeless. We know there's some people that don't. I think the other thing that's changed, and a very prominent professor just wrote about this in a very prominent journal where he was reporting that one of his biggest problems is that all of his detractors have too many social media followers now. Um, basically, what he means is that Carl Bergstrom is being pointing out all the flaws in his work, and Carl now has 400,000 people that follow him. There is a really different thing that's true now about scientists. I, we have friends and colleagues who two years ago, they were well known in our spaces and some of them had published popular books and were kind of well known. But now there are some of these people that are household names and they have follower counts that are way up into the influencer level. And so I do think we have some additional tools in terms of our ability to reach people. Um, and we've seen some of the power of social media. I think we, we have to not be afraid to engage with it. So this is the other thing Brandon and I were talking about is some of the folks that annoy me the most are incredibly popular and people point to them as like the sages when it comes to COVID. And I can build a really good forecasting model, which is just whatever they say, do the opposite because they've been wrong about absolutely everything. And nobody seems to care. They're just out there talking about the science. They're communicating with people. Now, one thing that does happen is that they tend to own up to it really quickly. They say, oh yeah, I was wrong. We're just trying to move fast. This is how science works. You have to evolve, et cetera. But I do think, again, if we care about if we, if we admit that we're fighting massive disinformation campaigns and we're gonna set aside anti-vax because that's been around for 250 years, we're not gonna, 30% of the people we're never gonna reach in that case. But we have to be willing to go into the social media side. We have to be willing to go into the print journalism 
on the television. But that's a very different skill set for how you actually do that. But it's also a very different skill set for how you actually successfully communicate something that's complex and nuanced in a way that you feel comfortable with as a scientist and a communicator. But that will, it's also going to capture people's attention and, and influence their behavior. And again, I think that that's a very SFI style problem. What's like, how efficiently can you communicate something that we know is literally complex by the definition? I don't know. I'm, I'm skeptical, but yeah, question. Um, yeah, that was an excellent talk. Um, this is Jeremy. Just good to see you, uh, even if remotely. Hey, how are you? Um, but so I was wondering, so I, you know, I spent some time on the CDC's website looking at their CD, their projections. So could you say a little bit about what, what, so after it seems like, you know, two years, CDC does have this sort of model averaging collection. I forget, it's this guy from, was it from, from UMass or something? But yeah, so UMass you, Amherst, you, Nicholas Wright. Yeah, say a little bit more about that. And like, and, and they, they seem to, especially during Omicron, they were, you know, stop, they stopped even offering the projection, at least for cases. So how, like, how good is it? Are people actually using this model averaging approach that they're doing or? Yeah, great question. And I, I think it raises a bunch of really interesting kind of follow-ons. So if I think the right model is somewhere in that ensemble, then probably averaging is the worst possible thing I can do, right? Because I'm just averaging a bunch of wrong models in with my right model. So the fact that it does seem to work pretty well, I think in and of itself is an important piece of data. Um, the CDC has invested a lot in trying to build this forecasting capacity, but also importantly, build our capacity to actually ensemble the models and compare them. So, you know, 10 years ago, it would have been impossible to do this because the models would have been, the outputs of the models would have been incompatible. People weren't sharing them. The inputs would be totally incompatible. The questions they're asking and answering. So in some ways it's been huge progress. We know these models are tend to be much more accurate than many of the ones that I've discussed so far. I think it raises a really interesting question about if we really think these are the most accurate models, what it tells us about the mechanistic structures that are in any of those individual models within the ensemble. But I think to your last point, turning off the forecasts creates an information vacuum that will be filled. And so, Brandon and I, again, we're talking about this. There's this real tension between scientists of like, I don't want to go out if I'm wrong. I don't want to go out too early. I don't want to, you know, say things where I think there's too much uncertainty. And all of those are true. But if we don't go out there, then somebody will. And that information vacuum will be filled. And so coming up with ways in which, you know, the, the forecasts that we think are more reliable in principle don't get turned off right when everybody needs them is that's something that we're going to have to do some reckoning around. And I'm hopeful. I know the CDC has this new forecasting center, but that's one of the things that they're going to try to work on. It's of course hard to do this work as an academic because you know, you're not, you don't have the staff and you don't have the resources to be working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week as a part of an Omicron response. That's something that you need federal government level dollars to, right. to work on. Does that answer the question sort of? Yeah, and I, th I thought it was interesting, even just looking at the, they weren't offering case projections during Omicron because of how the uncertainty, but even people on Twitter, like even we're getting a, approximately when it was going to peak, or people were saying, you know, third week, fourth week of January. And even though the, the case projections on the CDC's site weren't saying that, even the back of the envelope sort of intuition we had. So it goes back to sort of your original point about <laughs> being able to make rough calculations about the behavior and somehow getting it right as much as the complex models were, so. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I know certainly I was saying that I don't have any special insight, but if something goes up this fast, it's going to peak pretty quickly. It should come down sort of fast too. And you can just eyeball it and get pretty close, which again, I think tells us something interesting about what's going on and maybe how we should be looking at some of these problems. Awesome. Well, I know we're over time. Thank you all very much. Um, everybody, anyone that's still online and 